some of you have been to Angelini's book club before at Woodstock. Yeah. Yeah. At Tony's store. And so this is our first time actually moving out of that space. And we would like to thank the Schaumburg and the New York Public Library for having us today. You know, I'm, I'm an ambassador for the New York Public Library, so this is like one of my perception of what marriage means about a man's commitments and his priorities. So uh, the idea that when you look at someone that you're looking to elect in the highest office in the world, that that'd be a part of it. However, I think it's important for him as an individual to own his truth and to not feel pressured, no matter what he's doing, to do something he may not be ready to do, um, no matter what the situation may be. Um, because when you do something for show, it shows. Like Donald Trump and Melania, they don't want to hold hands. She don't want to hold hands. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. You know, so I just want people say that. <laughs> but it jumps right into one of the topics about the book. You just mentioned doing it because you feel that pressure, right? And you talk about the book, how people get married when they're not even ready to fully commit, right? So, wow, well, okay. <laughs> 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 you feel that? <laughs> uh, so what are some of those reasons as to why men feel like they have to get married? Is it us that's pressuring them? Is it the pressure mm. to Tony Lowe and his mom? Sometimes we feel like we're dating you, but um, we have to, women feel like sometimes we have to pressure you, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. or else we might be stuck in this, okay, we're together, yeah. we're living together, mm -hmm. we have kids, and all mm -hmm. of that, but why aren't we married? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think part of it is that with men, you know, there's this idea that we buy into at a young age that commitment doesn't equal power. <laughs> commitment equals weakness, but that's a myth. The man that commit shows his strength, not his weakness. But what happens though? I'm with you. But I think what happens is that when you feel um, when you don't, when you've been taught, commitment is weakness. 
not pounded. And at the same time, you've been taught that you know you need it, right? So if you're in a situation, you know, with a woman and you aren't actually being honest, here's why I'm afraid to commit. Here's what my issues are. Sometimes you can get yourself into a situation where you're committing, not even before you're ready, but before you even understand what that means for yourself. And but at the same time, I think it's important for women to not allow, if you want a commitment, be clear about that. Right. Don't don't let a man drive the momentum of a relationship to a place where you're in a gray area and you don't know what's going on. Because it's important for you to say, hey, I want commitment. And then give him the opportunity to give that commitment if that's what's in his heart. Because a lot of times men will not commit until they realize, yo, if I don't do this, I'm going to lose the best thing in my life. Yeah. 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 You know, it's again, it's like if men were taught to live in this box. So, you know, society says, okay, if you're a real man, you are a provider. You, you, you don't cry. You are strong. You know, all of these things. And so as men, none of us fit that box. So as a result, we end up getting broken because when we don't fit the box, we end up usually getting met with some sort of violence. Somebody says, stop crying. What's wrong with you? Man up. All of these things which we hear, they ultimately hurt us. So what happens is, as men, we buy into the false, the false ideology that, oh, i got to have to make a certain amount of money for her to love me. No, love is unconditional. I, I have to be in a place where I want to take care of myself and be accountable for my behavior, right? And if I can do that, that's way more important than how much money I make. Because if you can make the most money but not be responsible for your behavior and be a horrible partner to that woman who actually loves you, I think it's about taking care of responsibility. And as men, like my life, you know, I married Megan and I started dating. You know, amen. Amen. <laughs> Without a doubt, you know, um, when we first started dating in early in marriage, made more money than I, I wasn't insecure about that. I'm like, this is great. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I didn't have a pressure of like, oh, I need to get to this place and now I'm ready to get married. As a matter of fact, committing to commitment has actually elevated and accelerated my growth as a man, not diminished it. So I really, really <laughs> but Now, is there anything to be said about how? Some men actually do tell you they're not ready for commitment, but how you hear it, how you receive it, mm -hmm. may not be. You may think he didn't tell you. I told you he wasn't ready for commitment. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sometimes, not all times, guys actually tell you verbally or they tell you unverbally. Like, listen, I'm not about this relationship stuff, and then. We start sticking to men as projects. Mm. Yeah, All right? we do. I heard what you said. I just nah. Yeah. Well, sometimes y'all don't act like it. Like a man will say, yep. "I don't want to be together, but treat you like you're his girlfriend." Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Woo! Like, said and what's right and what's not and I did a post on on, uh, on Instagram uh, a few days ago and I said you know ladies if he tells you he doesn't want to commit believe him yeah. Thank you. and here's why because 
it, 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 one of the theories of the book is that every man struggles between love and lust, mm -hmm. right? Lust is a selfish impulse for personal, professional, uh, financial, or sexual fulfillment by any means necessary, That's even right. if those means are detrimental, mm -hmm. right? It's a selfish yeah. thing. And I, and I use the metaphor of the dog <laughs> to describe lust. Uh, every man also has love in them, love of themselves, love of God, love of the woman in their life, love of community, love of family. Um, I call love the master. It's yes. so important for us to master the dog, to put love in control of lust. Why is this important? Because the dog likes to operate in shadows. And why that's relevant is that a lot of times a man will say, hey, I don't want commitment. But then the dog in him will do everything that looks like commitment yeah. to intentionally keep her in a gray area yeah. Yeah. so that he can get from her what he wants, but yeah. he has no long-term intention. Exactly. That's all of them. It's crazy. It's not science. <laughs> Is one is for the, for the women out there when he tells you believe him say all right cool you don't want commitment and I want commitment I'm not going to allow you to get me into a space where we're doing commitment like things without you telling me we are committed because I don't want to be in that situation and for men when we practice mastery and this I know this is going to sound absolutely crazy but it's all right because I wrote about it um, as a man when we practice mastery mastering the dog means listen I'm going to put other needs before mine so even in that dating situation you're talking about in that month, you may realize, as a man, I like her, but this really isn't the right fit for me. Mm -hmm. Even though I enjoy her companionship, even though I enjoy the time we're spending, I know that the longer I hang with her, because she may be more serious than I am, mm -hmm. I'm going to do collateral damage to her heart. Mm -hmm. And because I care about where she's going to end up, more than I care about where I am now, I'm going to let her know, I don't want to do this. That's mastery. It takes more responsibility. But at the end of the day, is it worth keeping her in a gray area when you know it's not going to work out? That is, is where the communication is really, really important. So going back to, to your point, you know, see, in, in a month's time, you can still evaluate what you're seeing in somebody. Who they are, even in a month's time, if they don't know you, you can still see traits of, is this somebody ultimately that I'm going to want to be with? Even if they haven't yet found themselves in a situation where they know you enough to want to sacrifice to that degree, which they would if they're in love. It's not like all of a sudden people become, fall in love and they become a different person. As a matter of fact, I think love reveals what was already there, good or bad. So in that month, the month is a seed. When you plant, when you plant a seed for a tree, it's still, the, the tree is in the seed. The tree doesn't become, can't grow into anything other than what's in that seed. So I was still in that month. If you're dating someone, evaluate who they are as best you can. And also, get a time. A month, four weeks is really, in my opinion, my humble opinion, not enough time to get to know somebody. At all. At all. At all. You know, um, in talking about, you know, this, this issue, I think so much is important is we have to build trust. And trust just takes a little bit of time in a relationship. Um, I was at Facebook, and I think I mentioned this when we were on the show. I was at Facebook a few weeks ago doing a, a talk on the book, and it happened that the audience was filled with predominantly women. And, um, hey. Hey, all the ladies in the house, hey. Um, and so here's what happened. So we were talking about uh, something relative to this and uh, talking about trust. And I said to the women in the audience, I said, um, uh, how many of you after a month of dating would give the guy you're dating the code to your phone? <laughs> and they said, no way. Oh, of course not. We never do that. I said, okay. Now I said, now listen, I'm not giving your business, but in your past, how many times in that same month have you given him your body? Oh. <laughs> I just say. It's an evaluation of, uh, especially if you're a woman looking at how this man treats women in his life, 
And if you're a man looking at how this woman treats other men and other people in her life, you want to see how does someone treat someone that can't actually do anything for them? That's a good barometer of the, the quality of human being that, that you're dealing with. And, and also, listen, uh, I, we live in a time where there's more information available to us than the history of the world. So honestly, if, if you're dating and if I was dating right now, I, I, I would check out who somebody says they are. I'm all up in your Instagram, your Facebook, your Twitter. I'm using every, why? Not to be a stalker, but I want to know what are you saying or what you're telling me, what you're actually living out. Because you can say one thing and do something totally different. So it's like, really I, important. Yeah, how many times have you look at somebody's social media and been like, oh, I don't think this is, I want to date this person. They seem super corny. Oh, <laughs> super corny. Yeah, sometimes you look at somebody's page and you're like, this is not, this is embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, I have a boyfriend, but I'm saying if you look at somebody's face, like I have, like one of my friends is dating this guy, and she does not want me to see his Instagram page or him because she's like embarrassed. And they're embarrassed of your, yeah, she's kind of like, I don't want you to think he's this, I don't want you to think he's that, and I'm like, it's fine. She might not be ready for her friends to pass. Any kind of judgment or statement on the guy. That's true. Because I agree with you. Like, I can't wait for it. My friends to read them. I really think that sometimes people present themselves, and we're going to get to social media and dating apps. Yeah. About that too. Yeah, we do. The great segue. But I really think that people show a different side on social media. And what I've recently learned is that sometimes people present themselves in a way that they don't really want to be judged based off of. And I don't think that that's fair for the other person. Um, for you to like show this one side of you on social media and then in real life show a different side. So how would you invite or give advice to people who are dating and are in those situations? Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, uh, social media, I mean, it's awesome, but man, social media can be better. <laughs> I mean, you know, come on, I mean, seriously, right? I mean, it's, I think in this day and age, in this, you know, modern time we live in, you, you've got to come to a social media understanding with the person that you're committed to um, because it can be destructive. Mm -hmm. So I do think that there's a lot of information that you can glean from how someone posts, what they post about, um, you know, what they're into. It does reveal a lot of information. And you have to decide, is that what you want? And here's the thing that's really important. If you see what they post and you do not like it, don't talk yourself into thinking that, oh, well, this will change over time. Mm -hmm. Amen. You've got to kind of accept somebody for where they are. And if they ultimately change, that's on them. Yeah. But if you say, oh, well, once we get together, all this will stop. Well, the way you met them, that's what they were doing. Right. <laughs> so, you know, you, you can't date the dog and then want to marry the master. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> uh, you know. So I want to take a step back. Yeah. Take a step back to the very beginning of the book. Please. And... I want you to talk about a little bit about navigating this book or going through the journey of this book. <laughs> For me, one of the quickest things I had to do when I got into the intro, just the intro, I had to throw out the notion of what, <laughs> like throw out the notion of yep. where women do this too, or throw out this notion of what about women accountability? Mm -hmm. Even though it, can, it, it has its head in there at points, <laughs> I had to throw out that notion because it wouldn't let me read this book fairly. Just mm -hmm. be honest. Yeah. Um, you also go on to say that Tupac, uh, uh, um, this is the real stuff on the world. Yeah, man, you know what stuff. But yeah, tell us why this is the realest that you ever wrote and about navigating this book, particularly for guys. Yeah. There's a lot of mention of dogs. Yeah, it's and I know it's, yeah, it's, it's and, and you go all the way with it. That's right. So, and for me, as I, as I mentioned before, I I appreciate you taking a position. Yeah. But it also for a guy can be very difficult reading this constant exactly. reference of dog, 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 so, um, you know, so I'll, I'll unpack all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, what I didn't want to do is, you know, uh, there's so many books written about what women have to do better, right. what women have to do to get a man. And I said, I'm not writing that book. I said, this is about what men have to do better. Thank you. Know, you. Um, 
we're the ones that aren't always, um, we're saying one thing and doing another. We're the ones that sometimes manipulate even when we may not want to be doing. And I said, okay, well, why is that? Why do we behave that way? So I had to take the position in the book that if you are a man thinking that I'm going to be pointing the finger at you or another woman, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, as you were you know, talking about the introduction, I had to go inside to myself and say, okay, well, wow, this is the realest book because I had to be the most truthful, the most transparent, the most honest. Mm -hmm. And I can't write and encourage you know, anyone that knows what I do or who I am to be truthful and transparent. We're not doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So as a man, it required me to look in the mirror and make some decisions. Um, who am I? What are my struggles? Why do I struggle? Where do they come from? And so I really had to go back into my history. You know, and I'll come to the dog analogy and why I use that mm -hmm. uh, in a minute. You know, I talk about in the book that you know, I, I discovered in my teenage years, my father passed away when I was nine years old. Uh, he died of a heart attack when he was 36. And uh, he was an alcoholic the majority of his life. And uh, so when he passed away, it was tragic. And, and I didn't want to go to the funeral. It was so painful for me. And so that left my mother and my grandmother, her seven sisters, that basically raised me and my brothers. And um, it was in my teenage years where I saw a picture uh, at one of my family members' houses. And in that picture was my mother, it was this female family member, and it was my father sitting on a bed. And my mother looked really unhappy, really mad. And my father and this female family member were smiling. And it, even as a teenager, I said, what's going on in this picture? What's happening? And he wouldn't want to tell me. And eventually, someone in my family told me. And they told me that my father had cheated on my mother with that female family member in the picture. Wow. So, what it did was it rocked my world. As a teenager, if my dad could not be faithful, well, do I have a shot? Do I even have a shot? Like, is it, and that's why I began to ask the question. You know, do men cheat? Well, well, can men be faithful? And the majority of women in my family would say no. They would say, you know, 99% of all men cheat. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what do you mean, why? And so as a teenager, I became uh, almost obsessed. What, what's going on in us? What's wrong with us? And then, as I began to look deeper into me, I said, aha, here's the problem. It's lust. We, we have this impulse, we have these urges, we have these desires that are unhealthy, that are unholy, that, that are destructive, and here's the problem. Not only do we have it, we don't talk about it. We suppress it. And we rationalize it. And we rationalize. I talk about that in the book. You know, explanation, rationalization, normalization. Yeah. So, so when I begin to actually try to articulate what lust feels like, it, it, the best way I could describe it was like an untrained dog. You know, so it's not about, you know, I say in the introduction, men are not dogs, right? But I think that analogy, and I love to use metaphors, I use it to describe how to get control <laughs> and how to articulate the problem. But that's how it feels. It feels like there is this, this animal thing in us that lust makes us feel like. Mm -hmm. And that's impulse driven, that's pleasure driven, that doesn't want discipline, that doesn't want accountability, that just wants to do what it wants to do whenever it wants to do it. And I felt using the analogy of mastering the dog was a great way to say, here's the problem, but here's how we can get control. Because then through that analogy, you get it. You're like, oh, God, here are the commands. Everyone's a dog. People are a dog owner. I'm a dog master, mm -hmm. right? If I don't master this dog, this dog's going to master me. Mm -hmm. So once I started unpacking the analogy, it worked. And that's why I used it. You know, and it never was it intended to demonize or, or vilify men in any regard. Because mm -hmm. I talk about my own truth. I say, I'm not saying men have one. I say, I have one, mm -hmm. right? I struggle. Here's my struggle. Here's why I struggle. And here's what I do about it every day. First of all. Now, we also talk about, and you talk about, dealing with guilt and shame in the book. And that's something that people have to learn, you know, to deal with it. Because sometimes you have these thoughts, things happen, and you punish yourself for it because you don't know how to deal with that. So let's talk about that a little bit. And I also want to ask, when things do happen that shouldn't have happened, and you feel guilty about it, you're ashamed about it, is that something that you share with your significant other? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, all of us, um, men, women alike, uh, deal with guilt and shame because uh, the reality is is that we look in the mirror and we know we've done things that make us not like who looks back at us and we're guilty I should have been a better person in this situation I shouldn't have done this I shouldn't have said that and that guilt leads to shame where we fundamentally start not to like ourselves because some of the things we've done things we did and people don't even always know right. but we know you're not as good as you think you are. That's what we say to ourselves. 
And so guilt and shame creates a really destructive internal dialogue where we begin to devalue ourselves, we begin to lower our self-worth, and ultimately what happens is when we deal with guilt and shame so much, we begin to live at a level less than what we're actually worth. And then we make decisions on that level. A lot of times people say, well, you know, why is that person dating somebody that, that clearly isn't on their level? A lot of it has to do with guilt and shame. Mm -hmm. Because they don't feel worthy of someone on their level for whatever reason. So this is why I talk about guilt and shame and that we have to learn to forgive ourselves. You know, we have to learn to say, you know, I, I wish that hadn't happened. It did. I'm not going to judge myself, but I'm going to work on doing better. Because all of us, all of us, we all fall short. All of us drop. And when we have guilt and shame, we think that what we have done is worse than what anybody else has done. And a lot of times we just have to say, yeah, it's wrong. I'm going to make it right. But what I'm not going to do is allow guilt and shame to, to fester in such a degree where I cannot live or breathe. And that's what guilt and shame can do. So how do we make it right? Uh, do we tell the other person depending on what we did? I believe that it's important. I believe that we have to be, we have to tell the truth. And one of the ways to take the sting and the power out of guilt and shame is to express it. Here's, here's what I did. I gotta come clean. You know, I've read places that if you cheat on somebody and don't get caught, that you shouldn't reveal that because then that's you unloading their own guilt and shame and hurting them. Yeah, you know, unnecessarily. I, I, I think that, um, you know, honesty is the best policy. I do. I really do. I really do. Anybody seen Blue Woman and Talk Back to the Dog? It's like, what? Isn't that a good movie? Well, here's the thing. It kind of deals with that, right? They went and ate something they weren't supposed to eat. And they thought they got away with it until the end. And that's why whatever we do, and we think no one else knows, what is done in the dark will come to light. It's in the ultimate that there's better to come clean. Take ownership and accountability and responsibility for it, and whatever's gonna come with that, take it. Versus living in the shadows and hiding and hoping that never one day will come out. That to me is a much harder place to live than living on the street of truth, even though that's a difficult one. So if you guys have something to say to eight, you gotta let him know. <laughs> but that does bring up a good point in reference to which stuff should you or should you not disclose? What is defined as that's cheating? Talks like everything. You want it all. I want everything. Because here's the thing. There's also a point where, like for example, you you spoke about like um, the dog-like behavior, right? And even if you're doing stuff like whether it's uh, I think you mentioned porn. You talked about um, I don't know if you mentioned what's masturbation. It? Masturbation. Some of those things your partner does right there with you, or She's in the knowledge of. So if not, so what? What if we both watching porn together, or we like, or we go, to, or she goes and like she buys your own porn, or your own porn. Exactly. We made a tape and watched it together. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Hey, hey don't do your own like every guy. I ain't that with you, hey. Because and the reason why I put that question up is because I found it as you're reading the book. You have to give yourself license. You have to give yourself license. It's like, okay, well, this is what this is. This is what this is. But a reoccurring question is like, all right, so what things are we actually calling like, okay, this is the dog versus, nah, we both like just happen to watch. We like more. Mm -hmm. You know, we like more to the strip club. I get her a dance. She gave me a dance, whatever. Mm -hmm. So what things fall into that space or is that something that all relationships kind of define for themselves? So, so you know, going to this area of cheating, you know, cheating is about trust. And are you violating your trust and, and the, the uh, sanctity of the relationship? So uh, cheating isn't always something physical. It can also be emotional. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk about this in the book, how to safeguard your relationship. You know, you can't allow anyone else other than your significant other to meet your emotional needs. Absolutely. And because what happens is if you cannot be 100% in your relationship, that percentage you cannot be is a liability for someone else to come and to meet that even if you don't want it. Mm -hmm. And so in the relation, it's so important part of the safeguard is to identify what works for us. And if you step outside of that, that is, an, that is a violation. Mm -hmm. So part of it is having an understanding and then holding each other accountable to that understanding. And this is why communication is so important. 
Because sometimes everyone has a different idea of what is and what isn't. That's why we gotta talk. We gotta say, okay, hey, what works for us? So going to this issue of porn and strip clubs and whatnot, uh, at the end of the day, what someone does in their relationship, I'm not gonna take a position and judge it. That's, I'm not gonna do that. We spend too much time judging each other people, telling people what they should and shouldn't do. If you are two consenting adults and that's what you choose to do, at the end of the day, that's your business. My point of view on it is that strip clubs and pornography feed the dog. They feed the dog. And the more you feed it, the stronger it gets, even if you feed it in the confines of a committed relationship. Because those things, in, in everyone it affects differently. But a lot of times, it's, it starts you going down a slippery slope where nothing is enough. Yes. You know, you can't go to the strip club enough. You, you can't make it rain enough. You, you can't see, it's, it's like you see the one thing you say, oh man, I, I can't believe I've seen that. Now you want to see something. And, and at a certain point, your appetite yes. grows so much that even the confines of your commitment is not enough. That's why I pulled out the perfect porn cocktail. Why did you say that? Because again, like every book club, no matter who the author is, always gets some relationships. Oh, is that right? And so, what happens. <laughs> it's just in the sense of every conversation. And through the journeys of our book clubs, I have yeah. changed my views on gender roles. Oh, look at, look, are you happy? Hey, what? Hey, that's what yeah. Where were they? 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 Where Whether it's the fact that we've been dating for two years, when are you going to ask me to get married? Because they don't want to feel like they've been pressuring that man, or they don't want to feel like they're that strong or angry black woman. Um, so I want to really get you to give advice to people about what is it that can, or how people mm -hmm. can communicate that without having that fear. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's what really stops people. Yeah, no, this is this is good stuff. Um, uh, for women in the audience, has anyone been in the situation Tasha is articulating where you may have been with someone but you were afraid to kind of bring up what you want? Um, I think there's more people for Tasha's chat. They clapped on the spirit. They clapped on the inside. I heard y'all. Y'all said amen on the inside. Um, here's, here's what I fundamentally believe. That where we can go really into a dangerous place in relationships, um, is when we have expectations that we have not voiced. Everyone has a different idea of what they want when they want it. So when I go into a relationship and I have a previous unspoken expectation of how this, this man may operate or should operate, well, if he's in love, he'll do this. Well, that may look differently. He may agree with you, but how that looks and how he does it may be different than your expectation of how he should do it. Mm -hmm. But when you've never expressed to him what the expectation is, what happens is you have an unspoken expectation. The person never got a chance to say, yes, I can meet that expectation. Mm -hmm. And then not only do, you, do they get it, not a good chance to meet it, you then judge them because they didn't meet it. And you never had a conversation. Mm -hmm. And then you're frustrated and you're mad and you're angry. And he's like, what's going on? You should know what's going on. Well, I can't read your mind. <laughs> so it's so important to, you know, for the women in the house, and I'll talk to the men as well, to the women in the house, not to be afraid to, or feel like you're pushing the situation, or pressuring the situation, about asking where you're going. All of us have the Uber or, or Lyft app on our phone. When you call that Uber or Lyft, when you get in that car, you make sure that you are the person that, that you have called the Uber and you're and that that going to where you want to be. Yeah. If you get into an yes. Uber that's going the wrong direction, what do you do? Get out. You get out the car. You don't sit up there and wait. Well, I hope they're going to end up in the <laughs> But that's what we do. <laughs> I love the analogy. <laughs> if they aren't going where you want to 
front door and say, I love you, but I got to go. Got it. Somebody else out there going, well, I don't want to go. Got it. I don't want to waste no more time. Got it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Now you go ahead, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cares about what he got to say. <laughs> so you, you talked about appealing to the master as well. Yeah. And so I just want to read a brief excerpt, excerpt before I ask this question. Okay. Women, if you feel the dog in your man has been in control more than the master, you can demand that the master in your man take control. I don't mean take control as a form of domination over you. I mean appealing to the love in your man to rise up and take control of his life. A great preacher once said that there's a king and a fool in every 